Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, just wanted to wish you happy holidays and a happy new year. Um, my daughter, Zenovia here, Moquito style. They're just a little bit, baby. <laughs> Say uh, happy holidays and happy new year. Happy new year, everyone. Uh, what are we going to do happy new on New Year's? Mm -hmm. Pop fireworks? Yes. Play, hang out with all your cousins? Mm -hmm. What about Christmas? Open our presents from Santa. Oh, okay, okay. What about the adultos? What are they going to be doing? They're going to get big presents. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty good. The children get little presents. What about the adultos? You they get big ones? Yes, they do. Oh, my gosh. I think <clears throat> you're my big present, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks again for hanging out with me uh, in the on the Los Libertinos podcast this year. I um, hope you enjoyed uh, what I've uh, tried to put out there. I uh, hope you stay with me uh, next year and uh, appreciate any support. Uh, be sure to let your uh, buddies, homies, tios, tias, primas, anybody uh, know about the show and uh, look forward to next year. Peace. Stay safe. Welcome, everyone, to Los Libertinos podcast. I am your host, Carlos Abelard, and this is Chingazos and Fire episode number 59. Our guest today is Daniel McCarthy. He joins us once again on Los Libertinos, and this is the last show of the year, so it's kind of cool uh, going out with a bang here. Um, he is the vice president for the Collegiate Network at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the editor of ISI's journal Modern Age. He has a background in journalism and was a columnist for The Spectator and past editor for The American Conservative. His writings have also appeared in The New York Times, USA Today, and many other publications. He has also recently written a new forward for a re-release book of essays by Wilmore Kendall called The Conservative Affirmation. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks, Carlos. Delighted to join you. Yeah, so for anybody that uh, wants to get a little bit more of an in-depth uh, background on Daniel, I encourage you to uh, check out episode number 10. I'll put a link uh, down below. But uh, since time is limited, we are going to get into the action here, uh, Daniel. Uh, so um, I was watching the, 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 the football game earlier, and... Uh, this was not my first question, but it came naturally. I was watching football and uh, thinking about the interview and uh, and um, watching some of the play on the field. Somehow, just this question popped into my head, and I was like, "You know what? Shit, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna ask it because uh, it's all right. This is the way it goes." So, basically, what I what, what you know during the Ron Paul years, and I know how you're connected to the Ron Paul the 08 campaign. I remember that you know I, I was out there with the hey, I'm a Republican. Uh, for Ron Paul to try to get delegates. I mean, I was doing the whole thing. I was tied into it. I used to get uh, called into a uh, local radio to do uh, like in-person uh, interviews, the Ron Paul guy and, you know, stuff like that. And when they would ask me, um, you know, uh, why are, you know, if I am a conservative, no, no. Or why was I a conservative? Yeah. You know, I would answer real fast. I would just say, well, I'm trying to conserve the original intent of uh, self-governance. That was just the way that I either, However, I must have heard it or whatever. That just was the way that I would always sum it up. But over the years, like since I can't really tell when, but, uh, you know, nobody really asked me anymore if I'm a conservative. You know, people kind of ask me like, you know, uh, oh, you know, what are you or like what, uh, you know, you know, what do you get into? And, you know, I I say, well, I'm a, I'm a Libertino, you know, it's kind of like a Latino liberty kind of guy. And. And that's just kind of my thing. You know, I got a podcast and I try to just do my own thing, uh, you know, self-govern myself if you, if you, you know, if you want to put it that way. And, um, 
And I say all of that because um, I don't know how the shift happened or why it did in me or to, you know, uh, to, 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 to stay away from maybe automatic, you know, I've got no beef if somebody thinks I'm a conservative, you know, the, the idea behind why I said many years ago, that's just automatic in me. Like, it's just like, Hey, you know, that's what I believe. I, you know, you want to govern yourself. Um, but um, I don't know. So I guess my question is like, if somebody asks you uh, why you're a conservative, you know, or what it means to be conservative, um, how do you respond? Well, I like the way you set that up, especially by talking about uh, your experience with the Ron Paul campaign and the idea of self-government in America being what we're trying to conserve. And certainly it's a starting point. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, a comprehensive description of what uh, every type of conservative in America is trying to do. But that seems like at least, uh, you know, where you would begin if you want to call yourself a conservative is saying, well, OK, we have a certain way of life, a certain system of government in this country. Uh, the system of government we have permits that way of life. It basically creates the possibilities for all the different uh, permutations on that way of life uh, that we have here that, you know, things work one way in Texas and another way in Virginia. Uh, you know, one town has one way of doing things and a, a city might have a different one in a rural area, another. So we have a country that's very large, that has a lot of different components. And in order for the entire thing to be free, in order for the thing not to be uh, overrun by people who have just one perspective and want to kind of uh, impose it upon everyone in different states and different localities, uh, you know, in different walks of life, et cetera, you have to have this federal system. And what we have is a very well-developed system of government that was, uh, you know, created by the founding fathers back, uh, you know, at the very end of the 18th century. Um, so that, you know, is one of the things we have to conserve is basically the, the Constitution of the United States. And it's endangered from a number of directions. Some of those uh, directions are, you know, the kind of, um, you know, Supreme Court activism, for example, uh, that we've seen uh, over the course of the last, you know, half century or so. Uh, sometimes you have, you know, uh, progressives or liberals, uh, left wing, uh, you know, people in uh, the, const uh, sorry, in, in the Congress who want to, uh, expand the scope of uh, centralized power in Washington, D.C., which therefore, you know, not only tends to run roughshod over localities and, you know, uh, you know, private individuals and families and businesses, but also it tends to drain from all the other, you know, parts of our country, the initiative to do things for yourself. If instead you have, you know, Washington, D.C. providing your income or providing, you know, various benefits and services, that tends to diminish how much effort uh, people and localities and families and companies are going to put into their own kinds of, uh, you know, uh, their neighborhoods and their own lives. So that's another reason why conservatives are against, you know, this centralization of power in Washington, D.C. Now, obviously, there are a lot of, you know, uh, ways in which uh, local self-government practices can be um, harmed or endangered by things outside of Washington, D.C. as well. So, uh, you know, we're not really in a situation where we have to face a major uh, you know, threat of military invasion or something like that in foreign policy. But um, if you look at the way that some countries, such as China, conduct uh, their trade policy, for example, where they will basically, in various roundabout ways, promote their own industries, promote the accumulation of jobs and manufacturing in their own countries, which tends to you know, sort of draw manufacturing away from us, um, that can be something that has very detrimental effects, not only on, you know, the economic way of life in Michigan or in Pennsylvania or in other places, but also uh, in the, the sort of community cohesion that allows for self-government in those places. That basically, if people are being thrown out of work, if they're jobless, they might go, you know, to Washington, D.C., uh, claim they want, you know, money from Washington, D.C. to come to their neighborhoods to bail them out, etc. So you get this kind of domino effect where self-government can be, uh, you know, damaged by these uh, sort of uh, hostile economic actions taken by China and by other countries like that. So uh, one of the things that conservatives are conserving is the Constitution, and it's the idea of, you know, sort of local community self-government. But then beyond that, I think one difference between conservatives and libertarians is that conservatives are often looking at, you know, the ways in which uh, the economy is also a factor in the well-being of localities that allows them to have self-government. And if you get away from you know, their economic strength, if you wind up decreasing their economic strength in the in the states and in the localities, then you wind up with localities that become dependent either on the central government or that, you know, may go into a kind of collapse and may wind up being, um, you know, um, having deaths of despair, people on opioid drugs, you know, crime rates may go up, all kinds of bad things can happen. So conservatism, I think, you know, is very similar to 
what um, many libertarians would like to do in terms of its view of limiting the central power of Washington, D.C. and strengthening uh, the states and localities. But one of the differences is just that I think conservatives are more inclined to look at a broad array of things, even outside of Washington, D.C., things like, you know, economics and, you know, what foreign countries like China are doing and say that there can also be dangers that come from those directions. So um, in the same way that I tend not to maybe embrace the term conservatism when I'm uh, being asked, do you do the same to not uh, embrace some of like, or like if someone calls you a libertarian, do you like, like, you know, get defensive a little bit, you know, like, hey, no, I'm not because this is the different, like, what is the, like, what are the differences that like, hey, this, these are it. I know you mentioned them, but like, it, it was kind of light, you know, like, hey, you know, so I know you said the e economic stuff, but to me, I kind of always understood that the libertarians were more like economic nerdy about all that, you know, you know, all that stuff. I don't know, like, uh, can you, can you kind of draw the line of, you know, this is why I'm specifically not uh, libertarian? Yes. So first of all, I think, you know, Americans uh, shouldn't get too hung up on these labels, that it's more important uh, to think about the ideas themselves that are behind the labels and to deal with other people as, you know, your fellow Americans, as opposed to dealing with them uh, based on whether they're calling themselves Democrats or Republicans or liberals, libertarians, progressives, conservatives, whatever the case may be. Um, I think in general, libertarians tend to view uh, free market economics as kind of a self-sustaining system that, uh, you know, if you just get the government out of everything, then people will you know, freely exchange goods and services with one another, and uh, that system will regulate itself. That uh, you know, uh, not only will prices be you know, matched between buyers and sellers, uh, so will labor markets, so will capital markets. Um, you know, businesses will start up and businesses will also fail, but that's okay because new businesses will get started. And just as this happens in uh, you know, the business world, it also happens in terms of uh, geography. So, you know, some towns might get started. Maybe they have a, a gold rush in the 19th century. So all these miners come in, they start, you know, panhandling for gold or whatever. And then, uh, you know, later on, the gold mines might run out and then the, the town might collapse or it might, you know, develop new businesses that then become self-sustaining. Libertarians are pretty comfortable with this, you know, sort of natural, uh, you know, creative destruction, it's often called, uh, which is both economic, but also has some of these social consequences. And libertarians will tend to say that, well, it's terrible. It's it's a bad thing if your town, you know, sort of loses its industry and, uh, you know, it, it falls on hard economic times. But, you know, if you have a free economy, people will be able to change. So even if they are, you know, used to being gold miners at one time or used to manufacturing aircraft at another time and they lose those jobs, if they if you have a free economy, they can easily move into something else. Whereas if you have an economy that is more controlled, then you may have it actually much harder for people to start new businesses and to move into new things. I think all of that is pretty much correct, except it's not, you know, the, the sort of uh, biggest possible picture that, uh, you know, you do have to look at some of the political effects that are caused by these economic dislocations. And you also have to take into account, um, as I said, uh, the larger world economy and the fact that there are lots of ways in which other countries can cheat or other countries can do things that, in fact, uh, you know, are going to be detrimental to us. So I, I think the, the good thing about libertarianism is that it always reminds us to take the free market seriously and not to think that we can just make up whatever policies we want without any regard for the way in which, you know, buyers and sellers and, you know, sort of free economic agents uh, act among themselves. But, um, you know, just as libertarianism reminds us of that, I think conservatism reminds us that libertarianism perhaps puts too much faith in just pure free market economics and that there are, is a need to take, uh, you know, account of social conditions and foreign policy conditions and everything else and looking at the economy as well. And then of course, there are a variety of other things, um, you know, on questions like the social issues, on things like, um, you know, same sex marriage or abortion, libertarians themselves often have a fairly wide range of opinion on these things. So on abortion, for example, it really depends on whether you think uh, the life in the womb is a human life that needs to be fully protected with rights, in which case uh, libertarians as well as conservatives will be against abortion. Or if you think that, uh, you know, what is developing in the womb is not yet a full human being, then uh, chances are you're not going to be anti-abortion. Instead, you will support, uh, you know, the uh, abortion rights. And with uh, same-sex marriage, uh, you know, libertarians, I think, ideally said that they would like to get the government completely out of marriage. Just don't have the government issue marriage licenses or anything. But of course, uh, both the people who support traditional marriage and the people who support same-sex marriage 
they all wanted government to stay in in that uh, you know that issue. So the libertarian position was just not really popular on either side. Uh, conservatives, you know, have said, well, look, marriage is the bedrock of our, our civilization going back centuries, and therefore, you know, we, we should continue to have it as we've traditionally had it. And progressives said, well, no, you can you can redefine it, you can open up the definition, and uh, that won't have any bad consequences. I think it actually does have, you know, consequences in terms of how men and women see themselves. I think some of the, uh, you know, sort of transgender issues that have come up more recently are a result, uh, you know, a kind of after effect of the same-sex marriage uh, ruling from the Supreme Court, uh, where in Obergefell v. Hedges, they, you know, basically na created a national institution of uh, same-sex marriage that has to apply to all the states. So, you know, conservatives are certainly worried about those social issues as well. And as I say, I think libertarians have a, um, a broad set of views on social issues, uh, whereas libertarians tend to have a very fixed set of views on uh, economics. Yeah, in uh, in preparation for this uh, interview, I uh, I jammed your speech that you had back in September at the Libertarian Scholars Conference, and it was talking about like the fusion uh, in the past between um, libertarians and conservatives. Uh, uh, can you talk about a little bit of that history and 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 some of these alliances and whether they were successful or not? Uh, what can you learn? From, you know, what can we learn from them? And um, and also, you know, if if it was just for show for the people that were like the insiders or intellectuals of these movements, like if is, is there any of that or did they really believe that they were going to do something that was big, you know, that like you call it like the fusion between like, yeah, I, I like the idea of that because it just seems like you can get a lot of energy behind something like that. But I don't know, you know, I still got to ask, like, you know, is there a little... Hey, you know, we kind of scratch each other's backs and we got some uh, a lot of good, uh, you know, I'm trying to say a little bit, man, but I'm not a hater, yeah. but I'm just, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, back in the 1930s, uh, you have Franklin Roosevelt, the Democratic president, who is massively expanding the scope of, of government power in Washington, D.C. with his New Deal programs. And, um, you know, this is something that uh, libertarians, or as they called themselves at the time, individualists, are among the first to object to. And uh, so coming out of the New Deal in the 1930s, and then also World War II in the 1940s, you have a pretty strong individualist movement, people who would later be called libertarians, who are very critical of uh, the amount of power that's concentrated in Washington, D.C. with the New Deal, and uh, basically the, the very status direction that the Democratic Party is moving in at that time. Well, after World War II, you also get a number of people who are starting to say, wow, here is Western civilization practically destroying itself. You know, you, you have had two world wars, the First World War, uh, you know, uh, in the 1910s, and then you have the Second World War in the 1930s and 40s. And, you know, what's gone wrong with Western civilization that we keep having these, you know, massive wars and we keep having these revolutions, these totalitarian movements. The Nazis take power in Germany. The communists take power in Russia. And of course, uh, you know, even at the end of World War II, uh, the communists are still in control of half of Europe. So it looks as if Western civilization has really gone seriously wrong. And so after World War II, a number of thinkers start to say, we need to kind of go back. We need to, to rewind the tape, find out where we made some mistakes, and start to, you know, figure out where we you know, sort of first started going off track in order to get back on track. And these people in the 1940s and 50s are uh, some of the first conservatives. So one, someone who's very influential here is a, a guy named Russell Kirk. He is a, uh, a professor who uh, is originally from the state of Michigan. He goes to Scotland uh, and studies at St. Andrews University. And he basically says, wait a minute, uh, the kind of tradition of conservatism that we find in Britain with the conservative party uh, in fact, has a parallel here in America as well, uh, that it's something you find, and not just only among some of the old Federalists, people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, but even someone like Thomas Jefferson actually has his conservative side as well. So Russell Kirk tries to rediscover a genealogy or a you know sort of family history of conservatism in America. And he says that it's actually very similar to the conservatism in Britain. And what he's trying to show is that, um, you know, if, if Western civilization is going to survive, it has to really un um, understand not only its form of government, not only its economics, but it also has to have a real sense of sort of its cultural values, its human values. Uh, and if it, it loses track of that, if it instead tries to say, well, 
we don't need to worry about humanity. We're just going to have science. We're just going to have sort of facts and figures and logic to guide us that we're in fact going to lose touch of um, um, basically the principle of good judgment, that instead of making good judgments as human beings, we're simply going to say whatever's efficient is what we're going to do. And the problem with that is on the one hand, efficiency oftentimes doesn't tell you what's really valuable in life. It tells you about less or more, but it doesn't tell you about better or worse. The other problem is that if you wind up being very utilitarian, very much just focusing on economics and on efficiency, um, you can wind up with a political system that people just don't, don't feel an emotional response to. It, it seems too logical, too cold, too impersonal. And then they start looking around for leaders who are going to bring more personality and more uh, sort of uh, fire and vigor to the way people think about politics. And that's dangerous because then you can wind up with uh, demagogues who come on the scene like Adolf Hitler, who are able to get people very angry about the Jews and say, well, you know, just blame all of your economic problems, you know, on, on Jewish shop owners or what have you. And, uh, you know, if, if we take out our anger on those people, then that's going to make us, you know, sort of more powerful as a country. You get these really awful developments. And then, of course, in the communist world, you have, you know, the Bolsheviks, the, the communists and the, the Soviet Union and Russia who go around and say, well, the problem is the middle class, right? Uh, we poor people, we should overthrow uh, the czar, the king, basically, of, of Russia. We should overthrow the landed aristocrats. And then we should also get rid of the middle class. And if we do that, then, you know, the Communist Party will be able to bring wealth and prosperity to all of the uh, working class people in uh, the Soviet Union. So you have these horrible ideas uh, and these horrible ideas of totalitarianism. Sometimes they're driven by this very strong emotional current, this hatred that someone like Hitler is able to organize. And sometimes they're driven by these really corrupted intellectual ideas like you find with communism. Communism is very philosophical. It presented itself as being a scientific theory. Uh, you know, Karl Marx, the philosopher who starts communism, was really, you know, a, a quite serious thinker, but he was a seriously flawed thinker. And the conservatives in the early post-war era, they basically say, you should not try to rationalize all of society the way the communists tried to do. And you should also not give in to these destructive impulses, which, you know, human beings do have destructive impulses. They do have hates. They do have fears. But don't give in to them like, you know, uh, you know, don't create a system that someone like Adolf Hitler can take advantage of. So conservatives were trying to restore a little bit of spiritual balance and and sense to um, you know post war uh, post war Western world and to America in particular, and the conservatives wound up having a lot in common when it came to criticizing the New Deal and criticizing the policies of Franklin Roosevelt with the libertarians. That libertarians and conservatives usually agreed that uh, you know too much concentration of power in Washington D.C. was a bad thing for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but the conservatives and libertarians often disagreed about uh, who their historical heroes were. So the conservatives tended to like, you know, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams and uh, various British conservatives. And the libertarians often preferred, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson or 19th century British liberals like John Stuart Mill. And so this question became, well, are conservatives and libertarians just working together because they're both opposed to the New Deal and both opposed to the Democratic Party under Franklin Roosevelt? Or behind all these differences in terms of who their heroes are, do they actually have some kind of shared common philosophy and common uh, uh, sort of family history? And so fusionism was an attempt by a, a senior editor at a magazine called National Review. His name was Frank Meyer to try to show that, in fact, conservatives and libertarians did have a common family, a common family history. And they split apart. Uh, basically, it's, it's like the uncles go to war with one another in the, uh, the 19th century, where you start to get uh, liberals, people we'd now call libertarians, uh, on one side focusing on liberty, and then you get conservatives on the other side focusing on order and tradition. And in the 19th century, they have this big sort of family feud. But uh, Frank Meyer's argument was that, in fact, if you go back earlier, if you go back to the 18th century and even go back all the way to you know uh, the Middle Ages, you would find that the uh, conservative impulse and the libertarian impulse often had a lot in common. Um, so that was Frank Meyer's effort. And I think there's there's a lot of truth to what Frank Meyer says. But of course, all these things are matters of degree. So uh, you can say, OK, you do have some common ground here, but you also have differences. And that's a question of whether you think the differences are more important than the common ground or whether the common ground is more important than the differences. Yeah, I uh, uh, you had mentioned that uh, that uh, American conservatism has like a lineage to the Federalist, and then uh, that has a connection to like uh, I guess like a British conservatism. 
um, you know, uh, that lineage after, so this is something that I just recently found out. So you tell me if I'm right or wrong, man, but uh, I was, uh, so it says <clears throat> that, uh, I guess after the Federalist Party, like actually like uh, died off or whatever that, because uh, the judges had like life tenure, that a lot of that, that, that lineage still stayed in the judicial system. And therefore they were able to kind of like, uh, I guess, push back or play a little defense on a lot of the stuff that was already coming down the line. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about the lineage of like that type of uh, conservatism as, as even though I know you said that, um, you know, even right now, I guess there's like judicial, um, you know, where they kind of like try to make laws on the, on the court and all that, but it doesn't always have to just be once, you know, even though it's mostly one-sided, the, you know, the right can get a win here and there. Um, but I guess at this time, uh, it might've been uh, playing a lot of defense because they were just leftovers. Or they're, they're, so I don't know, can you kind of speak to the, the, the conservatism in, in, in the, through, through like the, the judicial lens of, of like how that, because I know even now when people like vote for, um, you know, Republican or someone like just say someone like Trump and people will be like, oh, well, I'll, you know, they'll hold their nose, but he's going to get some of our people into the courts and all that. So it's still something that is uh, important because uh, they'll vote for someone they hate or they really dislike because they want to get somebody in the court. So I don't know. Can you kind of speak a little bit to the judicial angle of it? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, in the uh, the first decade or so of American history, uh, after you know, after the adoption of the Constitution in 1787, uh, you know, George Washington becomes the first president, and basically everyone loves George Washington. Um, but after George Washington has served eight years, he steps down, and uh, he's succeeded by his vice president uh, John Adams, who wins the election of 1796. And John Adams is a Federalist. And Adams is uh, worried about, among many other things, he's worried about the French Revolution that's going on in Europe. And he thinks that the French Revolution is, you know, it's not just an overthrowing of a king. It's not just the creation of a freer form of government the way the Americans themselves did in the American Revolution. Uh, but he sees the French Revolution as, in fact, uh, basically overthrowing all of civilization. I mean, they're even changing, you know, the 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 uh, the names of the months of the ca on the calendar, for example. They are, you know, converting uh churches say what, say what, say what, sorry sorry say, say that again say what what are they doing <laughs> yeah the uh, uh the french revolutionaries they actually change the names of the month months uh so instead of having you know january february march uh they start renaming all the months because they're trying to remake almost everything really and they do the I've same thing with the churches that yeah no it's crazy uh you know so july i think becomes thermidor they have all these different names that they uh create for the uh the uh the calendar and then uh, they do the same thing in the churches. They basically go in and they get rid of all the Christian stuff in some of the churches. And they put in, you know, this. they try to invent a new religion. They, they put a goddess of reason, uh, you know, on the uh, you know altar of Notre Dame or whatever cathedral. And uh, so uh, the French Revolution really was pretty wild and extreme. And uh, John Adams says, I'm afraid something like that could happen here. And Adams thinks that Thomas Jefferson is basically very sympathetic to this, you know, sort of wild revolutionary movement in France. And so, um, so John Adams is very concerned about, you know, if Thomas Jefferson ever becomes president, he thinks there's going to be a French style revolution in America. And Jefferson did, in fact, like the French Revolution, although he wasn't quite as crazy as uh, John Adams thought that he was. So uh, John Adams, you know, he serves four years as president. Uh, he loses the election of 1800 to Thomas Jefferson. And, uh, you know, as uh, Adams is about to leave office, he makes a lot of last minute judicial appointments. So he's giving, you know, uh, you know, Supreme Court justices and, you know, lower judicial roles to a whole variety of people who support him and the Federalist Party. And uh, what he's hoping that they will do is that they'll stop Thomas Jefferson from being able to do everything that he wants to do as president. So there are some conflicts as soon as De Jefferson becomes president where you know various policies that Jefferson wants to interact uh, wants to enact, uh, you know uh, some of the appointments that he wants to make in his government uh, are being frustrated by the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court in fact starts to uh, basically you know the the Constitution itself doesn't say a whole lot about the powers of the Supreme Court, but uh, you know under Jefferson's administration you have this Federalist leaning Supreme Court 
which decides it's just going to do some of these things. And, uh, you know, it claims to have a kind of judicial discretion to do these things. So uh, early on, uh, you know, the more conservative party, the, the Federalists, uh, does indeed have this component of judicial activism. Um, the judicial activism more recently, however, has been uh, since the, the New Deal. So I mentioned Franklin Roosevelt uh, a while ago. And uh, Roosevelt, you know, in addition to being president for four terms, in addition to creating the New Deal and all these new bureaucracies in Washington, D.C., he also, um, he was frustrated that he couldn't do everything he wanted to do because the Supreme Court wasn't quite, uh, you know, sort of uh, left-wing enough. So one of his ideas was to pack the Supreme Court. He wanted to expand the court, put more justices on the court, and he would appoint, of course, people who agreed with him and would give him rulings that, you know, uh, would expand his power. He didn't get away with that. The, uh, the Senate actually prevented uh, Roosevelt from doing that. Um, however, the Supreme Court was so kind of alarmed and shaken by this threat that um, Franklin Roosevelt had posed that the Supreme Court justices then start to agree more and more often with uh, Franklin Roosevelt when he creates new uh, regulatory agencies that are telling businesses what to do and whatnot. So that's kind of the beginning of, uh, you know, the middle and late 20th centuries uh, impetus towards massive judicial activism, where Supreme Court justices start to, you know, take a larger and larger role in all kinds of things. Um, and of course, you know, there are issues like uh, segregation, where the fact that the Supreme Court is getting involved is probably necessary because uh, the states themselves were discriminating against their own citizens if those citizens were black, for example. Uh, but there are other things where the Supreme Court then starts to say, well, you know, not only do you have to get rid of segregation, not only do you have, you know, um, have to integrate your schools, but you also have to have a program to kind of bus students from across, you know, different parts of the city in order to create the right kind of racial balance in your schools. So that was going from beyond uh, just being opposed to segregation to actually trying to engineer how many students of what race would be taking part in what schools. And a lot of parents didn't like that. Uh, a lot of black parents didn't like it. A lot of white parents didn't like it. And so uh, there was a, a big backlash against the Supreme Court. And then you see other decisions like uh, Roe v. Wade in uh, 1972, I think it was, which uh, legalized abortion all across the country. Before Roe v. Wade, you actually had a number of states, including California, where Ronald Reagan had been governor, which legalized abortion. So you just as you have today, some states had legal abortion and some states didn't. But uh, with Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court basically said every state now has to have abortion rights because we're going to say that this is now a constitutional right that is implied by the Constitution, even if you know, the Constitution doesn't have the word abortion or anything like it in, in the text of the document. So judicial activism becomes a, uh, a major um, source of popular discontent in the late 20th century and really even in, uh, up to this day, where conservatives in particular are very unhappy with the uh, decisions that the Supreme Court is making. And so they start calling for, first of all, they want justices to be appointed who are going to be much more textualist and much more originalist. That is, they're going to pay attention, first of all, to the actual wording of the laws. So if the, you know, if the Constitution doesn't mention the word abortion, then you shouldn't be saying the Constitution tells us what abortion policy should be. And second, they also want uh, justices to pay attention to the original intentions of the legislators who make laws. Basically, you know, if Congress passes a law to do one thing, a Supreme Court uh, justice can't say, you know, 30 years later, well, I really want this law to do something slightly different. Instead, they want justices to say, no, whatever the, the uh, Congress and the legislature decided, uh, you know, when they passed the law, that should be what controls how the law is interpreted today. So that's basically the origin of conservative thinking on uh, judicial philosophy uh, up to today. But you're right to call attention to the fact that, you know, very early on in American history, uh, the conservatives were, you know, certainly Thomas Jefferson felt like, you know, the conservatives and John Adams were on the side of the people who wanted to put power in the Supreme Court, take it away from the public and, you know, have the Supreme Court do a bit of governing on its own. And that was one of the major conflicts between uh, sort of John Adams and his, uh, you know, his party and Thomas Jefferson and his party, um, which was how much direct, how much, how much democracy there would be in America. And the Federalists generally said, well, there should be less and the Jeffersonians tended to say, well, there should be more people, you know, should vote on a lot of things. And there should be a lot of uh, sort of uh, a more, you know, uh, fully engaged public. You should expand the franchise. You should limit the checks upon uh, the uh, kind of laws that the people can you know, pass or the amount of power the people have. Whereas the Federalists said, you know, yes, you want to have popular self-government, but it needs to be kind of uh, it needs to work in slow motion. It needs to basically be limited. It needs to be careful. 
You need to have, you know, uh, Supreme Court justices, but also, you know, sort of wise elected officials like John Adams, who are telling the people to slow down and take it more slow, carefully, and basically not get overexcited and become, you know, like the the revolutionaries in France who want to go and change everything about their society. Yeah, no, um, yeah, small steps for sure. Very small steps, if if any, right? Just very small, very small. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, kind of what's going on right now. Uh, I've never got in a very clear take, and my take has always been. Well, let me tell you, so like the free speech stuff, right? Like, so, um, you know, right now, Elon Musk, uh, you know, he got Twitter and he opened it up because, yeah, there's a lot of censoring that goes on of conservative or right wing angles on on things. Uh, and, you know, that kind of feeds into like, well, they're censoring us because you see, we are right. So then pe- uh, people kind of get into their bubbles and it doesn't, you know, regardless of whatever side you're on, you know, people should just always communicate and try to talk things out and whether they agree or not, you know, so what? It, it's just people should be able to talk. But um, uh, I've always kind of taken the the side that when like uh, Donald Trump got deplatformed or Alex Jones or any, any of these people that I always just did take the thing like, well, it's the company could do what it wants. You know, it's a, you know, you could say, well, it's a private company or this or that, but the idea never came to me about that. Oh, you know, I would hear then the the argument that well, they're not just private companies. Uh, they are the public square now, and 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 because they're the public square, they, they you know they got to be regulated. You know, just different things. And I don't know. I've always taken the 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 view that to me the public square is still like in front of your county courthouse, and like if you can get enough physical bodies to go talk some shit. Well, people, the news or whoever's going to go out there to go cover it, like, you know, like to me, it's always been like, it's more of a, you really got to get on the streets and do some and do something because that seems more real to me. Now, I do get the efficiency behind, you know, if you can post something and it reaches millions of people, I mean, that's obviously more efficient than going on the streets and doing it, you know, so I get it. But I've always just been kind of, uh, I don't know, I've never really, I'm kind of don't have a real good answer for myself for it. I, I kind of get a, a lot of the different sides of it. So I guess my ask, my, my question to you is, uh, you know, uh, uh, your line of conservatism or the way that you think, like, what is your take on the free speech of like, you know, these social media platforms and then, or the, against the backdrop of like the public square, but is it, you know, that, that whole Man, it just sounds like a big old bowl of pozole, man. It's all seems like all kinds of stuff going on. But like, what do you, you know, what is your take on it? No, I think you're right. It really is a complicated mess. And, um, you know, I like the fact that Elon Musk has taken his own money. He's bought Twitter. Uh, well, his money and, you know, he's pulled together some investors and whatnot. But uh, he's privately taken control of the company. And uh, now he's changed the, the company's policies. And of course, a lot of progressives who were very happy with the previous ownership, uh, when it was conservatives who were being uh, silenced, are very unhappy now because they say, oh, it's out of control. You've got too much hate speech. you know." And uh, so they're leaving the platform of Twitter. Uh, it turns out that those progressives, you know, they don't really like the idea that um, you know, one should stick it out and c- continue to be involved even if you don't like the owner of the platform. So previously, they were saying conservatives were kind of being hypocritical because, you know, conservatives were basically saying, oh, this free market entity, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, should be regulated because we don't like the owner and we think the owner is biased against us. Well, now you have Elon Musk, who is not biased against conservatives, and uh, he's not really biased against progressives either, although he certainly has his own personal point of view. But I don't think anyone has accused him yet of trying to shut down uh, progressive speech on, on Twitter. But nevertheless, a lot of progressives who previously said conservatives should just, you know, tough it up and uh, and, uh, you know, should not be calling for regulation. They're now, you know, saying that they're really you know, shocked and appalled at what Elon Musk is doing. And to their credit, I mean, they are a lot of these progressives are not calling for regulation right now. They're trying to just leave the platform and start their own new things. And of course, conservatives tried to do that. Conservatives tried to start several alternatives to Twitter. And what happened is that the other major tech companies, including Apple and uh, Amazon and others, they basically said to the competitors who started out trying to you know, compete with Twitter that, well, if you're conservative and if you're not following the rules that we think you should be following, we're going to take you out of the Apple store and we're going to take you off of uh, Amazon.com's um, uh, Amazon Web Services, which is a major you know, sort of service provider, uh, you know, just providing servers for um, 
Twitter and for other things. Um, so when you do that, you wind up having you know several companies, all of which are different, kind of working as a uh, you know it's, it's not quite a conspiracy, but it certainly looks kind of like a conspiracy, right? They're all collaborating together, ganging up, and basically saying we're all going to make sure that we exclude people who don't follow exactly the rules we want to follow, people whose speech might not be you know the kind of speech that we want them to have. Um, and that's a problem when you have that collusion or collaboration between several large companies that all have, you know, a lot of power in the public square and they come together and they say they are all going to impose one point of view. Uh, that's a dangerous thing. So I tend to think that, you know, when you have individual companies just acting on their own, uh, that's fine. And when you really do have a competitive, uh, you know, process and a, you know, sort of openness to competition, if you can start a new Twitter, if you can start an alternative to Twitter, that's fine. Then see if that works. And if it doesn't, you know, that's up to the users. It's up to you. Uh, you can't complain. But on the other hand, if all the companies get together and say they're jointly going to do uh, something, then it's a question of, okay, you know, um, it's extremely hard for anyone to compete with, you know, three or four of the tech giant companies coming together and trying to, you know, impose something on, uh, you know, how we communicate. So uh, at that point, I think then you do have questions of, if not antitrust laws, certainly law, uh, you know, regulatory questions about the degree to which, uh, you know, very large companies working as a cartel are controlling uh, what can be said online. Now, I think as long as you don't get to that, as long as you don't have these companies all working together to enforce the same line, then, you know, competition is usually going to work out. And, uh, and I think with Elon Musk taking control of Twitter, you actually see that rather than waiting for government to try to pass some regulation that you think you're going to like, it's better off actually if someone like Elon just buys Twitter and can immediately change the policies. So um, the other thing too is that you know while while I think libertarians uh, you know have good principled reasons for being worried about government coming in and trying to regulate uh, social media, uh, there's also an element of give and take here where even if you aren't actually going to get the power and try to regulate uh, social media just by talking about it, you're kind of sending a warning signal to uh, these companies that they should you know try to be a little more open-minded about including conservatives. Because if they're not, conservatives are going to start calling for government power. Uh, now, that's kind of like a threat. And, you know, you wouldn't want to see a personal kind of threat. You wouldn't want to say, hey, you executive, do what I want you to do and start selling the things I want you to sell. Or I'm going to beat you up. That would obviously be illegal and bad. But if it's, you know, if it's politics, uh, that is uh, unfortunately just an element that is always present in politics where people say, hey, I might be thinking about creating some regulations. And even if those regulations aren't created, the mere talk about it is enough to make executives think, okay, maybe we need to, you know, make sure that we're a little nicer to the people who are unhappy with us, because otherwise they might start looking to government power. And I think that is, you know, again, while there's an aspect of that that is not great from a libertarian perspective, uh, there's also an aspect of it, which is, you know, it, it, it doesn't involve actually creating like uh, regulations. What it does is instead simply raising the level of talk to a point where uh, the companies realize that, you know, people are serious and there's going to be a political backlash if they don't uh, you know, change the way they operate. And I think that's fair. You can talk about these things and uh, that's less of a concern than when you start actually creating regulations and trying to take over. Of course, you know, one thing that libertarians and a lot of conservatives too are aware of is that when you do create these regulations trying to do one thing, oftentimes there will be unintended consequences that wind up doing the very opposite. So uh, many times large companies actually like to be regulated because regulations are burdensome. You have to have lawyers and uh, you know, programmers and compliance officers, a whole battalion of bureaucrats who are going to make sure that you are following the law. Well, a big company like Google or, or, you know, or Twitter or Facebook, they can all afford all those lawyers to do this. But a small competitor who wants to start up, they will be crushed by the regulatory burden of trying to comply with the demands that are being made by a set of regulations. So small competitors, small businesses are usually harmed more by regulation than big, uh, you know, sort of giant corporations like Microsoft or Apple or Facebook. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned uh, unintended consequences, and my brain went to uh, my uh, recent uh, interview that I had with uh, David Beer from the Cato Institute, and uh, that was about like uh, regulating uh, uh, immigration. You know, during COVID, um, they uh, stopped a lot of the normal travel uh, uh, on the southern border, so. In response, the cartels uh, still had to, uh, you know, offer a product to a market, and they, there was a shift from heroin to fentanyl, 
uh, because less trips, more power, more potent. So they, so, so that ended up happening, but as, uh, uh, as, a uh, immigrate, you know, as travel opened up, uh, over the years, well, you know, they haven't shifted back to heroin. They just stayed at, at the fentanyl stuff. So I guess I bring that up to kind of ask you a little bit about like, uh, the immigration, uh, uh question, um, and, 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 and I, I, I want you to, cause I know we've talked about this before, uh, but for anybody that, uh, it might be new listening to us uh, talk a second time. Uh, can you kind of give your um, your perspective on on immigration, and then um, maybe let me know if you know if you could freestyle this. Uh, I guess I'm imagining, or maybe imagine that you're going to give a speech to a spectrum of uh, immigrants: uh, legals, non-legals, visa, work visas. I don't know how many are there. Uh, what well, all kinds of you know, there's all kinds of stuff that people can come on and, you know, the illegal ones, all the, all, all my cousins. Right. And, uh, you know, also besides your take kind of, you know, what does your brand of conservatism, uh, 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 offer to, uh, like what kind of, uh, uh political ideology, uh, uh, ideology does your type of conservatism, uh, uh, what can it do for them, uh, uh, now that they're here, regardless of what, uh, status they are, you know? Yeah, I think I'll, uh, you know, start off by talking about uh, the legal immigration system. Um, and I would, you know, even li limit a bit more than we currently do to how many uh, legal immigrants we bring in. But certainly legal immigrants who go through the process, which can, you know, take many years, in fact, uh, they've, you know, sort of uh, put in a lot of work and they've, uh, you know, followed our laws very carefully in order to become uh, first of all, you know, sort of permanent residents or legal residents, and then ultimately, in many cases, uh, citizens. And uh, I think it's very unfair to these people who follow the law and play by the rules that you have illegal folks who just jump over the queue and, and don't obey the rules and who get the advantage of breaking the law. So um, you have a perverse system where if you reward lawbreaking by saying, OK, well, you, you skipped ahead of the line uh, and now you've you know, just come in illegally, but we're going to have an amnesty and therefore we're going to forgive you and you can be here, you can stay legally now. Um, that really, you know, it, it, it's it, it's a it's a big F you basically to the people who followed the law and did, you know, the right thing. And it creates a perverse incentive because then you're basically saying, wait a minute, if you are wanting to immigrate to the United States and you have a choice of either A, doing the lawful thing, which is going to take years and be very difficult, or coming over illegally, uh, and you're you know, going to be forgiven if you do come over illegally. then of course, everyone's going to do you know, the illegal route. Now, that said, uh, so, so you know, I, I do think the distinction between legal and, and illegal immigration is important. And uh, I do think illegal immigration needs to stay illegal. Uh, so I'm generally against uh, you know, amnesty programs and other things. And uh, now on the question of legal immigration, like I say, I would, I would restrict it even beyond uh, what we have restricted it right now. But that's kind of a, that's my immediate step one policy. Step two, you know, once we see uh, how things work out economically, culturally, politically, et cetera, uh, once you've, you know, limited the number of immigrants, then you may say, okay, well, we actually, you know, uh, would benefit from, uh, you know, put, bringing in a lot more and that we benefit, you know, not only certain, you know, uh, certain employers would benefit and not only would certain, you know, political parties benefit, but then in fact, there would be benefits that would be so, uh, you know, widely distributed across the spectrum that uh, this is something that we really want to do. Uh, you know, uh, you know, all across, you know, Republicans and Democrats, uh, you know, hotel companies, but also software companies, but also, uh, you know, uh, mom and pop, you know, grocery stores in the in small towns. Um, one of the things I, I criticize about our current immigration policy is it's basically for the benefit of certain segments of America against, you know, uh, other folks. So it tends to be for the benefit of, uh, first of all, the Democratic Party, of course, which has, you know, long had a, uh, you know, uh, a, an advantage in terms of getting immigrants to vote for it. Uh, but it's also for the advantage of uh, corporations that want cheaper labor. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that a country is, uh, should have transparent borders where you just let the labor market, you know, be uh, across uh, national borders. I actually think that a, a country needs in order to function well, uh, to have a labor market that is internal, and that's different from the labor markets that are outside of it. And that's for a number of reasons. It's to make sure that employers, for example, are you know thinking about American citizens when they hire those citizens, 
that they are trying to you know, increase their skills. Right now, one of the things that a lot of companies do is they say, well, instead of investing a lot of money to train Americans to be software engineers, I could hire much cheaper software engineers and bring them over from India on an H-1B visa. And that's bad in a number of ways. First of all, it means that instead of investing in the people of your own country, you are cherry picking the people from other countries, which is doubly bad because, of course, not only is that uh, you know making your own people kind of lazier and less skilled, but it's also um, uh, you know draining some of the best minds, the most talented people away from countries that need their skills. In India, for example, um, and then you know you have these H one B visa holders come over and work in America, but it turns out they're they're not quite indentured servants, indentured servants, but. Uh, their H-1B visa is tied to their employment status. And in fact, it's tied to their particular employer. So in other words, if you immigrate uh, on an H-1B um, uh, work visa, uh, you have to remain employed by Microsoft or whoever has hired you. And you can't look around for another job. In other words, you can't com compete uh, you know, freely in the job market. Uh, and if you leave your job with Microsoft, you get deported basically. Uh, so it is, it's a bad system that is done for the benefit of these employers. Uh, it's not good for, you know, a lot of the immigrants. Uh, it's not good for the countries the immigrants come from. And it's not good for American citizens either. Um, so, I mean, my whole thing with immigration is to make sure that we are investing as much as possible in the people who are already here. Uh, and that means, you know, that primarily we should be, uh, you know, proud of having a preference for people who are already Americans in terms of getting jobs. We should not say, oh, it doesn't make a difference whether a job is, you know, in America or whether it's in China or India. Or, or we shouldn't say that it's it's a matter of indifference whether a job is you know uh, being worked by an American citizen or by uh, someone who's brought in on an H one B or by someone who may have you know come in illegally. Uh, no, that in fact you know we really want to make sure that our own citizens, because citizenship is important to a country, of course, uh, they should be the ones who are at the top of the line. And then you know what comes after that is based upon kind of what are the needs of the country, uh, based on not just you know sort of purely economic calculations as a lot of our libertarian friends would, would do it, but rather are based on larger sort of qualitative decisions about, okay, is this economic benefit going to be widely distributed? Is it going to be something that, uh, you know, is clearly not, you know, sort of causing Americans to become less skilled or, uh, you know, be a less employable and all of these other components. Um, and I would say, you know, I mean, the reason to have this restrictive system of immigration is because this actually preserves the American system uh, you know, both the economy and the political system that have worked very well over the course of, you know, most of the last 200 years, uh, and, you know, maybe a bit more, in fact, and that um, this is exactly why immigrants want to come here in the first place. We have a system that works very well. We have a, a flourishing economy, uh, you know, and it's not just, I mean, obviously, you know, e economics is a very large component, in fact, is, you know, uh, for some immigrants is the, the the primary thing they're interested in. But especially those immigrants who want to come and, and live here, who may ultimately want to become citizens, uh, you know, making sure that America still has the same kind of, uh, you know, cohesion and strength that it's had throughout its history. That's a big part of what they want to buy into. They want to become part of. And in order to do that, you have to just have some limitations uh, as opposed to throwing open the borders and saying, well, uh, you know, we can have everyone come from every part of the world and, uh, you know, um, uh, Basically, that you know, if, if what it means to you know have uh, uh, companies investing in your skills or education investing in your skills in this country is kind of uh, you know just too expensive. I mean, it's why we wind up with these places uh, like the Rust Belt, you know, Michigan and uh, parts of Ohio and, and Pennsylvania, where you just have you know towns that are closing down and you know industries that are shutting down, and uh, it's not necessarily that people are unemployed, but they may be employed in jobs that seem like dead end and low skill. And, uh, you know, they may you turn to drugs the, as a way to... Uh, you, think that's, you think that's the immigrant, the immigration's fault? You think that's the immigrant fault, the the legal or le like more immigrants caused the, caused that type of uh, like the Rust Belt to go down? It wasn't like other factors? Or you think it oh, was... it's a lot of other factors too. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's not, not one thing. But um, what I'm saying is that you have to invest uh, in the education and in the work skills of your own people. And if you have the alternative of getting those skills more cheaply abroad through immigration or through, you know, <clears throat> or through offshoring uh, the businesses, you know, if you can either import workers who have skills, but who, uh, uh, you know, have not required as much investment as the Americans may require, 
or if you can just take your factory and move it to, you know, to India or to China or wherever, uh, both of those things are going to be bad for the Americans who wind up not, you know, getting the kind of skills and the kind of job and experience that they need. So it's not that the, the immigrants are at fault and it's not that the other countries are at fault. It's really the fault of our own political leaders who say, uh, you know, we're OK with Americans becoming less skilled and less, you know, sort of um, uh, closely connected to their business world over time. And instead having this global system, which is efficient, and it does make a lot of money for, you know, a lot of businesses, uh, but it also kind of leaves behind a lot of Americans and a lot of places in America. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, no, for sure. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. I know that, uh, uh, like, even some of these people at Cato or immigration people will say that for sure, like, the, there is one set of people that does get uh, hurt from, like, illegal immigration, and it's, like, non- non-college uh people or like you know or non the ones that didn't graduate or what you know whatever there's like there is a class like hey man they do get like hurt and you know that sucks you know that sucks i mean that, that that's that's unfortunate um uh, yeah um uh the and, and that kind of leads into uh one of my last questions here that's always fun um to talk about and uh that's uh secession i know that uh right now we were talking about you know, globalism and a little bit of the, 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 how that ties into immigration and cheap labor. So, you know, I'm an advocate for Texas to be uh, an independent uh, nation again. Uh, I know it sounds a little kooky sometimes, but, uh, you know, I kind of like the idea. And along right now with the World Cup, uh, my bit is to always say that Texas will win a World Cup before the United States does. And um, I always say that with the vision. I mean, I have a vision, man. It's 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 crazy that I, I have a vision that, yeah, that Texas will have its own. Uh, uh, well, that Texas will be independent. But this is kind of the question here because I want to see if there's any middle ground or any fusion that we can have here, uh, Daniel, on this issue. Uh, so I know that you are, uh, I, I mean, against uh, Texas secession, and uh, feel free to talk why for sure. But um, the the other step that I've kind of been. Uh, 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 kind of looking into is that would you be opposed uh, to the idea of there should be I don't know if it's a movement but it's not because it's just me the only one that's saying this but like that Texas should um, just how like in the UK uh, Scotland well the uh, Welch and diff these different uh, uh, countries that have their own historical backing they're individual members of FIFA and my thing now is instead of going full secession is crazy is to say, well, sh should Texas be allowed to as its own history of people and its own uh, uh, just like those type of uh, country uh, or those type of states over there in, uh, in the UK can, you know, should Texas be allowed to uh, uh, apply to become its uh, own member like on for FIFA? And to me, it's like uh, it's nonviolent. Uh, it's it's doesn't have to be considered serious, but it's still a good step in my direction if. Texas was to be a FIFA member uh, alone or whatever, but I don't know. I guess I'm freestyling here a little bit. Feel free to tell, uh, you know, to talk about why you're opposed to Texas secession. And if, I don't know if the idea of, if, if it really hurts anybody for Texas to uh, have its own uh, FIFA membership, uh, I don't think it does. And, but, you know, it could lead to something more in my, in my, in my favor, but um, I don't know. Yeah. Whatever you think freestyle for sure. No, that, that is, a, that is a cool question. Um, and, you know, um, it's interesting to look at the rules, whether it's FIFA or whether it's other sporting organizations, uh, because, you know, some of these organizations, they do have, uh, you know, sort of separate uh, teams for Scotland or for England or for others. And some of them, it's all just, you know, sort of combined into one. And, uh, and it gets controversial because, of course, you know, Britain does have these, you know, traditional uh, nations that are components of it. Uh, so that's England and Scotland, uh, Wales to a certain extent. Uh, Northern Ireland is a very complicated uh, matter, but, you know, the United Kingdom includes all of those components. Um, but then you get into, you know, difficulties like if you have Spain, for example, uh, are you going to let the Basques or some of these other regions that may, uh, you know, uh, have historical identities that are, you know, quite uh, distinct of their own, uh, are they going to also field their own teams, uh, you know, and how does this affect secessionist uh, ideas and whatnot? Um, so that this it can involve these uh, sports teams and very uh, uh, sports leagues in very difficult questions that become very political very quickly. That said, um, you know, I actually I think it's a good idea. I would I would maybe even get rid of the idea that you have to have, um, you know, in things like the Olympics and whatnot. There there can be some sporting events where you do things on a purely 
national level. That can be the whole, you know, like with the Olympics, that's kind of the point of the whole thing. But I think with most other, uh, you know, kind of uh, leagues and, and, and sporting uh, events, um, it, it's, it would actually be kind of fun to have regions and states and, you know, subunits of a larger country represented. I think that would be uh, perfectly, uh, you know, healthy, actually. And that it would actually be good in some ways, even for the, the larger nations themselves, because what it would do is it would give them a better sense of their own regions and the ways in which those regions have distinct identities and the way in which those identities, you know, hopefully fit together in composing the larger nation state that they're a part of. Um, as far as my views on secession in general, um, I've never, you know, sort of uh, targeted Texas in particular. <laughs> I think, you know, there are, you know, um, yeah. One set of arguments against secessionism in general is just that, um, uh, you know, larger larger states are usually, uh, larger, you know, nations are usually more secure, more defensible than smaller ones. Uh, so, you know, the United States is very, very secure. There's no one who can really mess with it. Um, because Texas is a very large piece of real estate itself, um, I think it, it would be viable as a nation state of its own. So it could do that. And uh, I don't think it would be, you know, in danger of being invaded by anyone or, you know, being bullied or pushed around. So Texas does, you know, satisfy one of these requirements in a way that smaller states, you know, like Iowa or whatever, uh, probably would not uh, satisfy. The other thing, of course, is that Texas does have coastlines. And, uh, you know, it's important to have coasts and to generally not be completely landlocked and surrounded by another country if you want to be a country of your own. So, you know, Texas is able to, to check a lot of the boxes that I think you would need to check in order to be viable as a as a country of your own. Um, but in general, one of the reasons I'm against secessionist um, uh, impulses within the United States is because I just don't think it solves any of the problems that people have. So oftentimes conservatives will you know, talk about secession because they think, well, you know, there are too many uh, liberals in California. There are too many progressives uh, you know, in various states. And if we separated from the rest of the country, we could have a more conservative state just to ourselves. Uh, first of all, many times these red states are actually dependent upon blue cities. So you're not actually going to have uh, the degree of, uh, you know, sort of conservative um, uh, orthodoxy or conservative consistency within the state that you think you're going to have. You're really going to have the same sort of cultural divides that you have in America, only on a, a somewhat different scale and with the, you know, things, uh, you know, sort of tilted in a slightly different way. The other thing, too, is that, you know, um, even if a, a state like Iowa were to secede, they would still be part of, you know, the sort of economic block with the United States. They would have a lot of the same corporations. They'd be, you know, receiving a lot of the same media over the airwaves. And so, you know, a lot of the uh, culture wars, a lot of the cultural conflicts that people might want to get away from, they actually couldn't get away from because they'd still be part of, you know, the economy and the media would connect everyone anyway regardless of whether you were a country of your own. Um, so I just don't think that secessionism really solves a problem. I, I think that, you know, if you have a difficulty in a large country like the United States in terms of dealing with people who disagree with you culturally, you have to work through that. Because if you can't solve that problem on the scale of the United States, you probably aren't going to solve it on a more local scale either. And of course, you know, it's one of the advantages originally that uh, the Federalist Papers talks about, that James Madison talks about in the United States as a whole, the fact that it is so large it was not, of course, not nearly as large back then, but but it, they knew that it was going to grow. And the fact that it would grow, the fact that it would be very large and have a lot of different elements in it would mean that it would be very hard to create a tyrannical power within the United States because um, there's so many sort of different interests and different cultures and different elements that it's impossible for one to kind of rise up and take over absolutely everything. So American freedom as a whole depends on this federalist system. Uh, but that said, I mean, Texas is a very large state itself with a lot of different cultural regions within it. And maybe you could have a kind of James Madison style federalism just within Texas. So, uh, you know, I think if any state is a good candidate for being a country of its own, uh, Texas is, is probably at the top of the list. Uh, but again, I just don't know that it really solves any of the problems that people, or at least that conservatives uh, tend to have with being part of the United States. Yeah, no, that's okay with me. I just want Texas to uh, have its own team. <laughs> but yeah, that's my own thing. But uh Man, uh, Daniel, thank you for coming on. Uh, I always enjoy our conversations. Uh, uh, man, I always feel a lot smarter, even for a couple of hours after I talk to you, man. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for coming on. Feel free to uh, uh, plug in where people can reach a lot of your work and uh, and uh, uh, the some of the new stuff that you got coming up. Uh, yeah, feel free to plug away, man. 
Very good. Uh, well, I will hold up a copy of uh, a Conservative Affirmation by Wilmore Kendall, which is the book that I've written a uh, preface for. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tory Anarchist, uh, a nice uh, little provocative handle there. And then, uh, you know, my writing appears in uh, The Spectator. And uh, I, as you mentioned at the beginning, I work for ISI, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, we do a lot of work with students, uh, you know, have uh, conferences and various programs. We help support student newspapers uh, on campuses all across America. So anyone interested in that, uh, please visit www.isi.org. You can find out all about it uh, right there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for doing the last year, uh, I mean, last show of the year with me, man. Peace and uh, uh, happy of holidays course, yeah. and uh, have a happy new year, man. Peace. Thank you.